since you were all here before, um, you know who we are, you know who the certs are, you know there's going to be a book giveaway at the end, and you know our books are available. So let's get started with the main content. Look how much time I saved. You did save a lot. We're going to be covering three topics today. Text blocks, switch expressions and pattern matching, and records and sealed classes. And you may be thinking that's five topics, and you are correct, we cheated. But they're in three different sections, and that is all that matters. Also on the exam, there are a number of other new features, like compact number formatting and helpful null pointers that are not on the exam. I use helpful in quotes because you have to be in, compile with debugging enabled for some of them to be helpful, and people don't do that in production. Com compact number forwarding is also really useful, and I found a bug in that. Which Good I'm, job, I'm Scott. I'm proud of. I reported and found a bug in the JVM for that. Okay, so. so our first topic today is text blocks. First, we have a piece of code here. Can anybody see what's wrong with this code? If you see it, call it out. Yeah, I heard a bunch of things about quotes. Too many quotes, the quotes are not escaped. The, these quotes, not good. And that's a problem. Luckily, text blocks help us sol solve this problem. We rewrote this code to use text blocks. You'll notice there's three quotes now. That's how you know it's a text block. And you'll also notice we got rid of all of the extra stuff. We no longer have the backslash ends, and we no longer have the unnecessary quotes. All of the quotes on lines two and three here are part of our string, and you can see what it's supposed to look like is how it looks on the screen. And if, if you're writing JSON code that you happen to do this for, this is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Or XML or SQL or any number of things. Okay. So definitely easier to read. This is the text box syntax. It starts out with three quotes in order to open the text block. Then it has a bunch of stuff. And then it ends with three quotes to end the text block. Okay. That seems very reasonable. Easy to remember. Now we have something interesting. There's two different types of white space with text blocks. There's incidental white space and essential white space. The difference is that incidental white space is not part of your string. It just happens to be there to make you or the ID happy. Essential white space is essential because it is part of your string. And we separated them. The first line of white space under the word string and the space is incidental. I could get rid of all of that white space and the behavior of my code would not change at all. The rest of it is essential white space because it's used in order to indent the XML and show us what's important. Okay, that, that makes sense. You know what's going on here. Oh, sorry, one more thing on that. So how do I know whether it's essential or incidental in the first place? The way I know is it looks for the first significant piece of code, which is basically the first thing that's not a space. And in this case, everything's nicely lined up, so everything before that is incidental. But if I move those three quotes at the end to the very beginning of the line, I would get rid of all of my incidental white space because I would be telling Java that everything here is important. Does that make sense? This is a bit of a tricky concept. All right, I see some nods, awesome. So now we have, when does the text block end? Well, in this case, we have the triple quotes at the end of the string, and we'll get back to that. First, we have this backslash s. What's backslash s? We know about the backslash things. There's backslash t, that's a tab. We've got backslash n, that's a new line. Got some others. Backslash s has not been a thing until now. And that is true, it is new. Backslash s means space. And it has two purposes. The first is that it gives you a single white space character. And I know everyone's sitting there like, I have a single white space character, it's a space. Which brings us to its second use. Its second use is to tell the text block that this is important. And everything up to and including that backslash s is important white space that's part of your string. Because if you didn't have it, it would just be stray white space at the end of your line, and who knows if it's important. The next thing is we have a backslash here. That works just like a property file and says this line continues on the next line. Do not add a line break. I just ran out of room on my screen, but I want it to be treated as if it's one line. We've got an invisible tab here. That works the same way as backslash s. Everything up to and including the tab is important. And now we have our new line at the 
for actual new lines. Here we have a backslash n. That means we want two new lines. We got one new line for free without doing anything. And then we have the second new line that we typed. What we do not have here is a new line after the closing XML for session because the triple quotes are on the same line. So that's saying after that XML, run, end it right away, don't do anything else. If those triple quotes were on the next line, you would have an extra line break at the end of your string. Okay, so you have the two new lines again with the backslash n. Speaker is one new line, no new line at the end. All right, so we've introduced this concept of three quotes. Well, how do we put three quotes in a text block? Because we could want to do that. You can escape just the first quote, or you can escape all three quotes. They do the same thing. One of them is easier to read. I'll let you choose which one you use. Okay, now we have indentation. These all do the same thing. Some of them are easier to read than others, but the indent method is a tool that you can use in order to indent all of your lines. Just curious, which one do people like best? Anybody like option one best? Two? Three? Yes, I like three best as well. Also, the indent method normalizes white space, so if you're using funky line breaks at the end of your string, it will take care of that for you and turn them into normal line breaks. There's also some strip methods. We've had strip for a while. It gets rid of white space from the beginning and the end. Strip indent gets rid of your incidental white space. Um, leading does strip it at the beginning, trailing does it at the end, and they're doing normalization for us. Now, that was a lot of rules and a lot of information. I assume you've forgotten half of them, which is great because it will make it easier to trick you. Our first question is how many lines does this print out? I'm gonna pause for maybe 30 seconds and let you start counting new lines. And as, as we said on our last talk, um, these are shorter than what you're likely to see on the exam, but we needed to fit them on slides and not take forever. The exam will have similar things, but they, they certainly will be longer in a lot of cases. Yeah, but these are hard. Yeah. We, we didn't make them easier, we just made them shorter. All right, who thinks it's A? One person, B? Some people, C? Some more people, D? Yeah, it, it compiles, you all got that. It's C, there are four. So let's figure out what they are. Select star is one line. Then we have the backslash n, second line. From table, the third line. And because we have the um, triple quotes on another line, that is our fourth line, giving us C, four lines. Okay, we've got another one. What does this one print out? Oh, sorry, how many lines does this print out? Um, you'll get more of what is this print out on the actual exam, but as Scott noticed, I didn't have a lot of space to have long answer choices, so I made them numbers. Scott, I may need your help with this one because I'm not getting the same answer that the answer key says it is. That'll be Okay. Fun. All right, who thinks it's A? Nobody? Who thinks it's B? Who thinks it's C? Who thinks it's D? All right, so I think it's B, but our answer key says it's A. So let's reason this out. Select star from is one line because it has the backslash and that becomes one line. From and my table are on separate lines, so my table is on a line by itself as well, but there's no line break after that because the triple quotes are on the same line. So I'm getting B. I agree. All right. It might have been a typo on our slide. Yeah. So, so we... No, that just announces that you're using a text block. Uh, that must have been an error in the slide. Agreed. Can you do me a favor? Can you take a picture of this and email it to me so I fix it? Um, I'll, I'll remember, don't worry. Okay. I'm glad we all think it's a, that it's B, because it's B. Next, how many lines does this print out? 
All right, who thinks it's A? B? C? C is D? It is D. There is one closing quote here and not three, which means this is not a text block. Uh, we mentioned in the last uh, talk, um, the exam will not necessarily trip you up on like commas, periods, question marks, like, you know, uh, punctuation, right. except if it's something like this. Like if it's something new with text blocks, they will absolutely trip you up on the number of uh, right. uh, double quotes. So, right. But not, you're not, not going to get a string that like starts with a single quote and ends with a double quote because that's been around since the dawn of time. Yeah, like if you see a for loop with like that ends in parentheses instead of brackets, that's probably an error more than something they're testing you on. Right. <laughs> Okay, next up, how many white space characters are removed by strip? Who thinks it's A? We've got a couple. Who thinks it's B? C? D? Okay, so we're a mixed group between A, B, and C. The answer is C. Strip removes leading space and trailing space. There are two leading white space characters here before select, and there is one trailing white space character, which is the new line, because the triple quotes are on a different line. And that gives us three. Last question in this section. How many of the many escapes here can be removed without changing the behavior of the code? People have their fingers. It only goes up to four. And after this question, we'll be turning it over to Scott to give some time to chug all his remaining soda. <laughs> Who thinks it's A? Nobody. Who thinks it's B? Lots of people. Who thinks it's C? More people. And who thinks it's D? Okay. It is B. Um, we can get rid of the escapes before and after name because we're in text block. We can't get rid of the escape before the, um, sorry, we can't get rid of the escape with the triple quotes there because we only have one. And that concludes, oh, sorry, and we can get rid of one of them because there's two. So we yeah. can't get rid of the first one, but we can get rid of the second one, which is where we get the three, which is Because that, that one, it doesn't end, the text block doesn't end on the last line. It, yes. Yeah. I like text box a lot, but I also like the other topics, and now I get to relax while Scott presents them. Thank you, Jane. Uh, welcome, everyone, for coming today. I forgot to mention during the last talk, um, it's great to see people in person again. Uh, this is our first conference, uh, you know, since events. So we're, we're glad to be back in person, and we hope to see, you know, more people at more conferences in the future. It's really exciting to see people again. Um, so I'm going to be talking about switch expressions and, and switch statements. Um, if you're not familiar with that, I'll be showing that in a second. But I do want to say during the talk, I am going to distinguish between switch uh, statements and switch expressions. Technically, they're both statements, but for simplicity, it's just easier to call one statement. The traditional one I call a statement, the newer one I call expression, but realistically, they're both statements. So here's an example of some, uh, a simple traditional switch, switch statement. And it takes a string value. If you haven't been using Java in a while, you might not know it takes strings for switches, but it does. Um, so can anyone, t can anyone tell me what they think this prints? Uh, just shout it out if you, if you have an idea of what this prints. GA, anybody else want to take a guess? <laughs> Tricked you up. It does, it prints all of them because there are no break statements. So it's going to match the first case and then just keep going. And these kind of errors, as you could probably imagine, are common in switch statements because I, I talked at one point over this talk or the last that we're gonna, a lot of stuff in Java 17 uh, reduces boilerplate code and switch statements are nothing but boilerplate. I mean, there's a lot of boilerplate and extra stuff you have to write. So this one is missing the, the three breaks, so it's gonna print everything. Now I'm gonna replace it with a switch expression. Now offhand, that might look very similar instead of, you know, instead of uh, the colons, we have the arrow symbols, which look like lambdas, but they are not lambdas, they're just reusing the symbol. Um, we also, so you see the error label there. We also have no break keyword. So one of the things that separates switch expressions from switch statements is that switch expressions, only one branch is reached, whether it's default, whether it's one of the case, 
at most one branch, unlike switch statements where you could have multiple branches reached. And then the third thing is you could actually have commas separating multiple values. Now this was actually added to switch statements as well, so this does work with switch statements, but it's newer because you know, it's, it's a new thing altogether in Java. So, but it works for both of them, uh, both switch statements and switch expressions. Um, here's another example. Um, I'm trying to remember what I was, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, that was, sorry, lost my train of thought for a second. So in this previous example, we have three branches. The switch expression does not return a value though. It just prints something out, so there is no return value for it. One of the, the values of using switch expressions and really where the power for switch expression comes in is that the entire expression can return a value. So you could actually do an assignment, you could put it on the right hand side of an assignment operation and return the value to a variable. Now that's really useful in a lot of environments where you're trying to, let's say, pick a color based on some input or pick a number. The way you would have done this in the past is you would have had a switch statement, you would have probably done a local variable, and then in each of the case blocks you would have assigned that variable, then you would have put break at the end of it, and you would have, and, and if you had wanted to mark that variable final, the compiler said no, because how, do, how am I not sure you're not visiting mo multiple case blocks? It wouldn't really let you mark it final. With switch expressions though, all of that goes away, the breaks go away, the multiple values go away, and you can assign the entire thing to a value, which is honestly really common. I used to, you know, convert switch statements into methods because I, I didn't like the syntax as much, but this lets you keep it as switch expressions and basically keep the stuff that you care about. So you can make uh, output final and you don't have to worry about things like that. Uh, so here is a switch value and, and it returns. Now the one rule, and we'll get to this a little bit shortly, is that they all have to have matching types. You can't return a string for one and an integer for another. They have to, mat they have to match whichever's on, the, whichever's on the left hand side of the assignment. So that's the basics of switch expressions. And I could honestly spend a lot of time talking about switch expressions. I will show you some more advanced stuff with switch expressions, but this is just to give you a taste of it. You really should you know, do some more research and learn about these more detail. But the first thing is that, be, like lambdas, so in lambda you could have a single line expression, but you could also have a block because sometimes you have a lot to say. So with this one, you could have a block in here and basically do the same thing in a lambda. You could, you could declare a lot of code inside the block. Now I will say if that gets too long, you should probably, like lambdas, you should probably break those into method calls. You should probably not have like 20 lines inside of a switch expression. Uh, one question comes though is how do you return, the switch expression, if, it, if it's on the right hand side of an assignment, still needs to return a value. You could use the return keyword, but then that could be confused with a method. So you need, so Java needed some way to return a value, so they added the yields word, uh, which is not technically a keyword, but you should think of as a keyword if it, if it helps. Uh, but the yield word actually basically returns the value for the switch expression. So same kind of rules that you would have in a lambda. Like in a lambda, if it's supposed to return a value, like if it's supposed to return boolean somewhere, you need to return boolean. If the compiler notices you create a switch expression that doesn't return a value, it will be very angry with you. So you have to use a yield somewhere and all the branches have to be covered and all that, you know, syntactic stuff. There is a third option though. So, or another option rather, is if you don't return a value, you are allowed to throw an exception. And the, because the compiler knows, well, if I'm throwing an exception, obviously I'm not returning a value. So that is allowed. So these are, these are what I would say more advanced uh, switch expressions, but, and, and probably not the ones you're gonna be writing regularly, but you should know they're available if you need to. Especially like the default place, like, you know, illegal argument exception is a good one. So let's take a look at this one. Uh, take a minute to read it, and then I'm gonna round of uh, hands uh, who thinks this is legal and who thinks this is not legal. All right, how many people think this is a legal expression that will compile? A few? All right, how many people think this is an illegal expression that will not compile? And I guess the third option is how many people will think this will be a runtime exception? So the answer is it does not compile. <laughs> and the reason is is because the return types are not compatible. The left-hand side output is a string, so all of the things that are returned by the search expression have to match that. If they don't match, if they don't match that, it won't even compile. So let's look at something a little bit more uh, complicated or a little bit more advanced. We're gonna use an enum now. If you haven't been using Switch in a while, they do support enums. In this case, we have an enum with a top and bottom. And the question is, do both, the, the, the question is, what is the difference between these two statements? Do they both compile? Do neither compile? Uh, how many, let's start with the first one. How many think the first one compiles? And I'll just do the positive here. How many thinks the second one compiles? So the answer is they actually both compile. And this is an example of more advanced sy or syntax that you're not likely to see on day to day, but you should be aware that it exists because there's more advanced things that could happen with switch statements and switch expressions. Also, don't do the first one because it's a lot of code to do the same thing that the second one does. Yeah, please use arrows when you can. 
or method calls if you, or, or method references if you can. So what about this one? Uh, this one's a little bit different. Uh, how many people, I'll, take, I'll give you a second to read it. So how many think the first one compiles? All right, how many people think the second compiles? The answer is neither compile. So one rule that you have to understand about switch expressions that makes them very different, make, you know, I mentioned earlier they return values, that makes them very different from switch statements. The other thing they do that's very different from switch statements is that every possible branch has to be handled. So every, in this case, there are two enums, top and bottom. That means you have to write a case statement for both top and bottom, or, there's an alternate, or you have to specify a default branch. If you do not do either, it, it will not compile, because the compiler basically says in the first one, okay, somebody passed in bottom, what do I do? Do I assign the value position null? Do I do negative one? Do I do zero? The compiler doesn't know what to do. It punts on it and basically says, oh, I won't compile. So you have to handle every possible branch. Uh, if it's an enum, it, that just means listing all the enums. You could always cheat and just have a default branch at any point. Um, if you are doing an enum, I do recommend a default branch anyway, because it's possible maybe somebody at some future point modifies that enum. So let's say the enum had two values. Let's say, let's say we added a new season. There were four seasons and we added a fifth season for, I don't know, winter, winter. We added another season. That will break your code if you're using a switch expression. So having a default branch helps future-proof you in case that the enum does change. Or you could not have the default branch and use the compiler to tell you you have to change something, and which one you do is a matter of personal preference. The question is, do you want it to be a breaking thing, or do you want it to be something you find out about at runtime? True. You, you, you could use that as insurance that if somebody does change the enum and it breaks your, your switch code, well, now I have to go back and update it. But again, it's depends if you're the same person or that person is five teams away from you. So just be aware of that. So what about this one? Does this compile? So we're not using enums anymore. We're using integers. A round of hand, how many people think this compiles? A few people. Uh, this one does not. So like enums, you have to carry, you handle every possible case. Now some people might sit there and say, all right, I'm going to list every possible integer in the world, like every possible from negative infinity or negative whatever the limit of int is to positive. You could do that. If I ever see that in code, I'll, I'll lose my mind. But that doesn't, that doesn't work for integer types or for any numeric type, to be precise. You have to use a default block. So you could try listing all of them, but again, don't. Um, especially for long. I think long, it, would break, it wouldn't even compile with long. But um, so for enums, you have the option of using default. For numeric types, def uh, even for short. Uh, uh, the, it's, it's required to use a default branch. So just keep that in mind. It's a special case for switch expressions, because again, the compile, if you entered five for this, the compiler is not gonna say, I, I guess he wanted null, or I guess she wanted this. It's not gonna guess. It's just gonna throw an error. So moving on to pattern matching. So pattern matching, I mentioned earlier about reducing boilerplate. Pattern matching is totally about reducing boilerplate. So if you've ever written an instance of operation, chances are you've also then immediately cast on the next line. So if you say num instance of integer, num instance of double, the very next line of code you're gonna write is to cast that thing. And it might be because you need access to methods, it might be for any number of reasons, you need to pass it to different values, but you're very likely to cast. Um, pattern matching gets rid of that. So it basically says, in, it, it does the explicit cast and the explicit assignment to a variable of that type as part of the instance of operator. So it's not a huge number of code, but if you've ever written the first one, you've probably done the cast in the second line. So there, we call that the pattern variable, um, and I'll get to that in a little bit more detail, but that, that's what you use for that. So pattern, one thing that's interesting about pattern matching is, is it introduces the concept of flow scope. This is another topic I could spend a lot of time talking about, but I'll, I'll try to be short here for time. But flow scope is different from block scope that you might see in a normal thing. So normally, if you declare a variable inside of a for loop, it lives for the life of that for loop. If you declare it for a method, it lives in the life of that method. Flow scope is different. Flow scope is, says that it's in scope if the compiler can definitively determine the type, which has some weird implications in some places. So in the first one, the first one compiles just fine because it uses the and operator. Um, it says that the, double, the num is an instance of double, and then on the next line, it, it, because it's an and, it knows that at that point that it must be a double or it wouldn't be allowed to go to the next line, so it compiles fine. The second one does not, though, because that uses or. So it's possible, let's say you have a value that's not a double, it gets to the second line, it says, well, I don't know if this is a double or not, I don't know if that method call is allowed or not, it's not gonna do a null pointer exception, it's just not gonna compile. So that's, and, and they are in scope, in this case, they are both in scope for the if statement, so inside that block they are in scope. Uh, how about this one? How many people think uh, these two compile? Raise your hand. 
Oh, I should give you more, more of a second to read it. All right, how many people think it compiles? How many people think it doesn't? A lot of unsure people. So this one does compile, but it, what, what we're trying to show here is that you could use the same pattern variable for both because it's only in scope for that block. Now, in this case, it ha it, it's flow scope, not block scope, but it, it, is, it is specifically for those if statements as it's in scope. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll be showing an example in a second that distinguishes that or shows you the difference. So what about this? Does this compile? A lot of people shaking their heads, so I'll go with that. Uh, no, this one does not compile. It's at, at, the reason is, is again, it, I'm going to say the block, but it's really the flow. At the point at which the second or the last line is being executed, the compiler doesn't know whether n is a double or not. If it knew it was a double, then it would allow it, but it does not know. So how about this one? Take a minute to read it because this is a little bit different. All right, show of hands or just nod or shake your head. How many people think this compiles? How many people think it doesn't? Good, I love these. You're all wrong. Um, it does compile. And this is a weird, this is probably the most bizarre example of where flow scope really differs from block scope. What happens is, is if something, if it's not a double, it will return and the method will be over. In this case, though, if it is a double, the compiler knows with absolute certainty that it is a double on that last line. So it does become in scope. So this is, this is probably the most stark example of where flow scope differs from block scope, and it's very unusual. If, one example that we use in our book is we, we rewrite this using positives instead of you know, negatives, and we add else statements. When you rewrite it with else statements and without the, the, the negative, it does actually make sense. But if you're just coming across this code randomly, it's gonna be very confusing, especially if you have like ors and ands in there. So be very careful with flow scope. It is not the same as traditional scope and differs in this regard. Um, so what about this one? Does this compile? I think I've done a good job tripping people up. Take a minute to read it. All right, how many people think this compiles? Share of hands. How many people think it doesn't? It's a good mix. Uh, this one does not, but for a different reason. Uh, n is a duplicate variable in this case. So you can't declare two local variables with the same name. Same thing with flow scope. You can't, the same thing with you saw, like in a catch block, you can't have exceptions both named E. In other places, lambdas, you can't duplicate things. Same thing here. You can't declare a second or a pattern variable that has the same name as an existing method parameter or a local variable. So last one, I think, on this section, uh, before we get to the questions. How many people think, well, they'll give me a minute to read it, but when, you, when you're done, I'll ask, how many people think this compiles? All right, raise a hand if you think this compiles. Raise your hand if you don't. Decent mix there. Um, it does, and it's unfortunate that it does. <laughs> so you absolutely can reassign a variable. Please don't. <laughs> For a number of reasons, least of which, uh, you know, maybe you're doing instance of number and now you've changed it to integer, which does inherit number. Like you could have typing problems, you have readability problems. You could actually, one of the things I was gonna say earlier is you could actually mark the variable final. So you can insert final between instance of and integer and that will compile and does prevent the variable from being reassigned. That said, that's kind of a lot of syntax to add. The better option is just don't reassign it. It's, you know, again, if you, I said in the previous talk, but if your if statement is like 100 lines long, you have other problems to deal with. And I want to add two things. Can you oh. go back? Can um, you go back? Yeah, sorry, yeah. Cool. Um, the first one is the idea of reassigning here isn't new. It's legal to reassign an exception to another value. And, you know, nobody does that because people would be like, well, what would you do that for? So it's the same idea. And the other one is if you're listening to these, does it compile, does it not compile, and, be, you know, cringing and being uncomfortable with it, it took me a number of tries to go through this and have it make sense just like when, with streams. And then once I got it, it did become mentally consistent. So you will get there too. Yeah, like you don't, in, in catch statements, you don't see final used in the like catch final exception E. You could, but it's better task is just not to reassign it. So first question. Uh, we're doing, if you, if you attended our previous talks, we do a section and then five questions. And you already did some earlier. But uh, take a minute to read it and I'll ask for a show of hands for each letter. All right, hopefully that's enough time. Uh, how many people think the answer is A? Raise your hand. B? Anybody B? C? D? I think we've tripped up enough people they're afraid now. 
<laughs> feel free to be wrong. I, sometimes when I'm reviewing these, I forget what the answer is and then I need help. Um, the answer in this case though is B. There's nothing particularly tricky in here. It's a relatively well-behaved switch expression. Um, it does not return a value though. It, it, it assigns a value, so it's, you know, there's no return type, but it, it is relatively well-behaved. Um, this one is a little bit more trickier. Um, which answer, well, it's, it's still, it's, it's one answer because we have A or B on the third one, but what value can fill in the blank to make this code compile? Oh, oh, sorry. Good question. There's no assignment. So I, 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 yeah, this is, this is one where I could spend an entire talk talking about switch expressions and switch statements. The one rule I should have clarified is it only has to have to require path if you're assigning it to a value because the compiler says, well, I need it to assign it to something. In this case, this isn't returning a value, so it's safe. If we had changes to be like uh, count equals switch ch, then you're right, it wouldn't compile because it needs that return value. Is your question the same thing? Sorry, that, 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 there's some very slight subtleties. Now, for regular coding, you probably won't need to know this, but for the exam, you will. So that's an excellent question, and it's a very subtle case. All right, so, sorry. Ah, well, that, oh, so much for that. Ticker's a little slow. The answer is not B, I don't know what, it, how many think it's A? No. Um, how many think it's B? So in this case, the answer is B, uh, and, and I'll explain why. So the return types for these, this is similar to using var, the return types vary, so it's an integer, it's a long, it's a double, it's another integer. So the compiler will go with, object will work because all of those can be automatically, or implicitly, sorry, auto wrap to the wrapper class and then uh, implicitly cast to object. So B works, int does not work because of the long value and the double value, so that won't work. Question? I'm sorry? Yes, I believe I, believe, I, believe I tested actually with var and it does. But, it would, but the type of var would likely be object in this case. All right, so another question. Uh, what does the following print? Hopefully I won't sneak the answer or explain the answer while I'm doing it. Take your time. I'm gonna have to pick up the pace a little bit. So in this case, how many people think A real quick? B, C, or D? All right, this one's not as bad. This one is A, the code does compile and it prints, it, it, the first, it's kind of stalling, is the battery going? Um, but it prints the first one, the X. All right, two more. Uh, which lines have S in scope? So this goes back to flow scoping. And I'm about to go a little bit quick because we're getting a little short on time. How many people think A, B, C, D? People are very unsure. Uh, it does not compile. So you can't use instance of with an int. You can use it with integer. Integer would have worked just fine. And I believe the answer would have been A in that case but you cannot use it with int, so just be aware it has to be an object type. Oh. Okay, okay, just because we still have another section. So. All right, last question before we move on to records and sealed classes. This was a little bit longer to read, so take a minute. So how many people think equals is implemented correctly? Nobody? Okay. How many people think equals is incorrect, is implemented incorrectly? How many people think it doesn't compile? Okay, so more people for doesn't compile. This one actually is fine. Not all, we have some tricky ones, but this isn't one of them. And this is a good example of where instance of pattern matching is really useful because equals has to have the contract in most cases where you're, where you're, when you're overriding the method, you have to take an object. So having this here is actually particularly helpful for that. Yeah, and on this one, your long form equals method checks, is it null? Well, if it's null, instance of is false, awesome. It checks the cast. If it doesn't cast, it's false, awesome. So we already fast forwarded to that. Then it does the cast, which is taken care of by the pattern matching, and the only thing left is the actual criteria. So we're able to have the equals method be what it actually does instead of all of that ceremony. Yep, now this brings us into a great uh, uh, segue into our next section which is there's a lot easier ways to write that code. Um, so I'm gonna move on to records and sealed classes. Now, what I like about these two topics is they're actually really different from stuff that's done in the past. So like switch expressions are kind of a variation on switch statements, instance of and pattern matching are a variation on, uh, inst well, the variation of instance of, and other things are variations. 
Records and sealed classes are pretty new. They're, they're pretty distinct. They're not, they're similar to things that have been done in the past, but they're also very different. Before we do that though, I want to describe what an immutable class is. So chances are if you're programming in you know, modern technology these days, you've worked with immutable objects. Immutable objects are becoming really popular. For one, uh, they're a lot easier to work with. You don't have to worry about random updates. They branch nicely with concurrency or they, they support concurrency because if you're passing around something immutable, you don't really have to worry about thread state and locking on objects because they don't change. They're created once and they, they never change their value. In Java, you could create an immutable class by doing a few special things. So one is to mark the, the fields final and private. Don't provide any setters, although I would say marking them private is, and final is probably good enough there. Um, don't make any sub, don't allow subclasses, mark the class final because else somebody could create a subclass that does something that makes it suddenly mutable. And write a constructor or a static method that takes all the fields and creates the object. So this is kind of common techniques and there's a lot of steps and people often make mistakes. So it's, it's a lot of things to do to make something immutable. Another topic you've probably worked with, I think probably all of you have, is POJOs, otherwise known as Java beans, if you've worked with Java beans. And these are usually, you know, a list of fields and then a list of getters and setters. I sometimes use the word, you could use for getter, you could use the word accessor. And for setter, you could, words, you could use the word mutator, they're similar synonyms. But you also have to write other things, like you often have to write a two string method, a hash code method, an equals method, uh, for them to be meaningful. Like, so if you have two POJOs that are both, you know, have the same data, Ideally, you want the equals method to return true for those. Uh, the default one in object, though, will not give you that. So enter records. So records are really useful and really easy to write. Um, they define a new type, as you can see here. It's not a class, although you could, it's fine to think of them as classes and to treat them like classes, but essentially they're not. They're a new type altogether, like annotations or interfaces. Uh, you give the record a name, and then you get about a list of fields. Now, What's really cool here, and what, what, what Java's really doing behind the scenes with the compiler, it is, a, it is doing a ton of heavy lifting to add things to this record. So normally, you might see things like, you know, the compiler adding a default no R constructor. Or you might see the compiler adding, you know, maybe a public for interface methods or public static for constants where you didn't have to do that before, so the compiler adds a lot. In this particular case, though, the compiler is adding a large number of things. It's not like before, it was just adding one or two things. It's, it's marking the record final, that's implicitly final, same way that interfaces are implicitly abstract, records are implicitly final. It's adding private instance variables for all of the methods listed in the declaration. It's adding accessors or getters to all of the variables. It's adding a constructor that takes all of the fields in the order that they're declared. And what I find more importantly, or most importantly, is it's adding meaningful implementations of equals hash code and two string. And by meaningful, it's one that actually looks at the field, so if you have you know, two fields with the same, or two records with the same title and number of pages, equals is going to return true on those. Same thing with hash code. Hash code is going to use the values in it to calculate the hash code. And the two string might not be what you want to output to like a user. It might be, you know, something a little bit abstract, but it's useful for debugging the same way that you can output a list and see the elements as opposed to, you know, the normal way if you outputted book, it would just say book, a uh, bunch of symbols, and then an identifier. It wouldn't be particularly useful. So it gives you really meaningful implementations. Now for two fields, that's not super exciting, but if you have a, a POJO or a record with 20 fields, uh, imagine every time you, you add a new POJO field. you have a POJO with 20 fields, I'm going to be really mad and come with my pitchfork. Don't do that. Gene's never been where I've worked. I did previously worked. Um, there, there were POJOs with 50 fields or 100 fields. But if, if you do have that though, they're, they're really convenient because if you have to add a new field, you have to go in and add getters, you have to go and add modify the constructor, you have to go and add hash equals hash code two string, and there's a good chance that you're gonna break stuff when you did that. Now there are other tools that will also do this, like Lumbach and a few other tools, but this one's built into Java, so no third parties, it's all native stuff. So let's look at an example of one. So in our previous one, it was just you know, one line or two lines if you got the brackets. Uh, we create, the, the constructor automatically exists, so we can just use it, so we just say new book, and we can output using uh, the, the accessors that are automatically created. Now you might notice if you've used Java beans, there's no git. So one of the reasons they're called accessors and not getters is because there are no getters. There's no, you don't have the word git in front of it. Uh, I find that convenient as someone who's worked with a lot of POJOs and had to write git set, git set, git set on every line. This is shorter and easier to work with, and there is no set, so you don't have to worry about that uh, because they're immutable. Uh, the other thing that's nice about it is you don't have to worry about is versus git. So you have, um, if you're using uh, Java beans, if it's a little Boolean, it's an is, but if it's an other field, it's a git. We, we punt on that decision altogether because we don't have is or git. So much more convenient. And when it outputs, it outputs something like the bottom where it says uh, book, and that's, that's the kind of useful or the useful implementation of two string. 
is that's all given to you by the compiler. So it's doing a lot of nice things for you. Now, it adds a lot of things, but that doesn't mean you can't change them. So in the first example, we're overriding what the, um, the title method does. So we're inserting our own version. And we're also adding our own custom method because maybe we want to add additional things. They are like regular classes in that you could do a lot of the same. I, want to, I don't want to say all because that's a loaded statement. But you could do a lot of the same things with regular classes that you could do with records. Uh, so one, thing, one last part where I want to close this out is to talk about immutability. So I mentioned at the beginning, records are immutable. That's sort of true. <laughs> they, they are designed to be immutable. But it is completely possible to create a record that is not immutable, as this example does. So in this example, we have chapters, which I think it's missing, but it, it starts with a, just the value of one. We create the record. We then add a, add a, add a value two, and then we also add a value of three. And the, fir the first one is that they, keep the, they kept a reference to the chapters uh, line, and the third one is they actually modified the record directly. This compiles and runs. Like this actually does compile and run and does output one, two, three, which means the record's not actually immutable. So what you have to understand here is when you're creating records, be very careful of the objects you put inside of it. If you have mutable sub-objects, which in this case list is a mutable sub-object, you have to be careful that you, you, it should be immutable, to be clear. You absolutely should have a record. You shouldn't have records with mutable sub-objects. That's kind of a bad principle because it defeats the purpose. So one way to fix that, and there are others, but one way to fix that is to insert, is to modify the values when they come into the record so that you make a copy of them. In this case, it creates a copy of it, which then the person, if they held the original uh, reference to chapters, wouldn't be able to do anything with it. Now, something that Gene talked about, I believe, in the last talk, is this actually happens to be an immutable type. So copy of um, is, is, is better than just creating a copy. It actually creates a copy that can't be modified. It's like list of. It's, 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 it's immutable list. So you don't have to worry about um, people modifying it directly. Alternatively, you could also um, override the getter for this, the accessor for this, and copy it every time. But if you start with an immutable object, you don't need to do that. So it's better to go that way. Also, the constructor thing doesn't work because if, if you're clever enough to keep the original, then you, changing yeah. the getter doesn't do much for you. So the other thing I want to point out here is this might, if you, haven't, if, you, if, you, if you have eagle eyes, you might notice that this constructor does not have parentheses around it. So this is what's called a compact constructor, and they exist solely for records. And they're kind of a nice feature because if you start using records, you start realize, realizing, okay, I need to do a copy when things come in, or I need to modify a value, or I need to do like two uppercase. So a compact constructor doesn't take any arguments, and it applies to the input construct, what would be the constructor parameters before the actual constructor is run. So it's basically a way to modify the input to be safe with your record. And if you think, and it could also be used for validation. So you could say something like, if chapters is null, throw in a legal argument exception. It allows you to kind of put what I would call the core business code inside a nice place without having to rewrite the entire constructor. Because if you rewrite the entire constructor, you have to do like this dot chapters equals this, this dot titles equals that. You, you know, it gets longer and longer. This is, the reason it's called compact is it says, okay, what do you need to validate and what do you need to change or modify when it comes in? So it's really convenient. As a side note, you can also implement the entire constructor or other constructors. There's nothing blocking you from doing that. So you can customize it as much as you want. What I will say is if you end up like adding a lot of constructors and overriding all of the getters and overriding this and overriding that, you probably shouldn't be using a record. Like the idea of records is to save space. If you're overriding everything, you could do it, but it might as well be a class at that point. Uh, one, other one other rule is the modifier for the, for the constructor must match whatever the modifier for the record is. If it's public, it has to be public. If it's packaged, it has to be packaged. And I already mentioned that that makes an immutable copy. So you're safe if somebody calls the accessor on chapters. So switching gears to, to sealed classes, and this is the last topic we're going to talk about today. So sealed classes are kind of like uh, enums. I like to think of that. I don't know if that's a good example, but I like to think of them as enums. You define a class that has a strict set of children that are allowed to extend that class. And we'll talk about interfaces at the end. Um, and for the most part, that's really all they are. They're kind of different from, from other things in Java. So normally Java is about, you know, any class can extend any other class unless it's marked final and reusability and all that fun stuff. This is stricter. This says only those four classes are allowed to extend it. One of the ways you do that is you use a permits clause, and then in the children you, you extend the, the parent class. Now one thing that also makes sealed classes differ from other types of classes or other structures is that both of these have to be compiled together. So if you just compile the parent class and the children don't exist, it's not going to compile because it doesn't know well, where's my fall, spring, summer, winter class? Same thing with the children. If you compile them without the parent, it's not going to know about them. They have to be compiled together, which is different from, again, most, most ways things work in Java. You can compile classes on their own, and it's not a big deal. Or you can compile them in some strict order. These, there's a relationship between them. 
Now, you may have noticed I put final in front of, in front of each of the subclasses. One of the, one of the, probably the biggest rule, and definitely the rule the exam is likely to ask you, is all the subclasses have to have one of three modifiers. They either have to have the word final, non-sealed, which is the first Java keyword or modifier with, with a hyphen in it, and sealed. So that is required. If you don't have one of those three, it's not going to compile. There's an edge case on that I'll get to shortly. But th those three are absolutely required because it has to know what the rules are. So final means that the class is done, the, the subclass hierarchy ends there. Non-sealed is an odd one that I don't feel comfortable using, but it does exist. It basically means you could define subclasses, unknown subclasses, that extend that class. So it basically says, like, if I had it on fall, then fall would be allowed to have other subclasses that extend it. To me, it defeats the purpose of sealed classes, but the nice part is, I mentioned at the beginning or earlier, they had to be compiled together. So the parent class is going to know if its child is non-sealed, so you can decide there. It's not like you're exposing it. And then seal just adds another layer of indirection if you want to add another layer. So let's take a look at a sealed interface. Um, a sealed interface is similar to a sealed class, but has an additional property that I think is kind of neat, which is it could, it could limit what interfaces extend the interface, but it could also limit what, what classes implement the interface. So on the first example, it's morning and evening are, are uh, classes, or, yeah, yeah, classes that implement the interface, and hour is a class that extends the interface. So it could be actually be used for both, which makes it kind of unique for interfaces in that regard. Um, in this case, the first one is non-sealed. That's fine. The second one, I said before it had to be final, non-sealed, or sealed. Well, you can't use final for interfaces. They're implicitly abstract. So that, that either gives you sealed or non-sealed for the interface. You don't, you don't get a choice on the other one. Uh, and then the last one is the edge case I mentioned. Record is implicitly final. So because it's implicitly final, you don't actually need the final modifier, but just be aware that's only because final is, is required for records. And there's a little pop up for that. All right, last, last, last slide before we go into the slides. Uh, take a look, take a minute to read this. How many people, after you've read this, think this code compiles? All right, show of hands, how many people think it compiles? How many people think it doesn't compile? How many people aren't sure? Uh, the answer is it does compile. So this is, this is a weird case, it's a little bit different, but it's something you have to know for the exam and if you're using it regularly. Well, I should say it, it, it compiles under certain circumstances. And the circumstance it is, is it has to be in the same file. If you declare a sealed class with its children in that file, either as a nested class or as a separate top level classes, it will compile. If they're not in the same class though, the permits clause is required. So that, that's if you compare it to the previous one we did earlier, there's a permits fall, spring, summer, winter, but in this one it disappears. And that's the difference between is it's optional only if it's in the same class. For nested classes, I think that's really convenient, but for other things, not so much. All right, our first question. Um, how many lines are needed to be removed for this code to compile? So take a minute to read it. All right, how many people think no lines need to be removed? Anybody? Okay, one line needs to be removed. Two lines need to be removed. Uh, or none of the above, three or more or some, some other value. Negative lines, I don't know. <laughs> uh, the answer is actually C. So two lines need to be removed. Uh, the first, does anybody know what the first one is? Shout, in order, Sh uh, shout it out if you know what the first one is. Yep, there are no setters in, on records. And the second one? There are accessors, but they just they would just be the word type. If you happen to name one get type, that would be very poor. But I guess you could. Uh, but the, yeah, those two lines need to be compiled. The last line compiles just fine. All right, uh, next question. Take a minute to read it. Questions with like four to 10 lines are common for the exam, and you only have what, like a minute and a half per question. So one of the things that you have to do when you're studying for the exam is to practice reading things really quickly. The 815, 816, you had more time. You had like three minutes per question. Yeah, but they don't exist anymore. No. So rush rushing you is training. Believe it or not. On the plus side, the exam doesn't usually mix things. Like if you see something with records, it's about records. It could be about other things, but not usually. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna knock on wood. All right, so how many people think A? B? C? D? Okay, very good mix. Uh, C, and the reason is is because of the access modifier on this thing dying, the access modifier on the second or on the constructor. 
So in this case, the record is public, therefore the constructor and compact constructor also need to be public. So these are, these are not things you're likely to encounter in everyday programming, but on the exam, they will ask you things like this. So they could ask you things like this. Go ahead. Hmm? Reflect. Yeah, so frameworks that use reflection are going to be really sad by the time you get to this version of Java because of the whole modules and restructuring thing. But you can add methods to a record. We didn't show that in the interest of time, but if you need your own getters, you can write them with the name get. Yeah, like we had some custom methods earlier. Uh, you, can, you can add get type to a, a record. It's not recommended, but you can. <laughs> Uh, moving on to the next one. Uh, how many compiler errors are in the following code? Notice I didn't put zero, so. So there's at least one thing wrong. I can actually remember why, there was, why it was the number it was this morning. All right, uh, how many people think one compiler error? Two? Three? Four? Some other number that I didn't list? <laughs> so this one, the answer is actually three, and I think one person got it. Uh, so, the, so there's a lot of compiler errors. So let's go through this line by line. So the final modifier is added to record, which is fine. Just like interfaces, you could add the word abstract to an interface. It doesn't, it's, it's, it's implicit, but you could still add it. The second one does not work for a number of reasons. First of which you can't have, I mentioned that records were like classes, but not completely like classes. One of the things that records don't allow is they don't allow instance, uh, instance initializers. I almost forgot the word. Instance initializers. The other thing they don't allow is you cannot modify uh, instance, uh, the local instance variables. So the instance variables are set specifically by the constructor. They have to be set by the constructor. If in any code within a record you try to modify, it's like modifying a final variable inside of any uh, you know, non-constructor. It's going to be mad. So, it doesn't compile. so that one, it's one line, but it doesn't compile for two reasons. Uh, the third one is actually really subtle, and that's the one I had to look up, or I had to remember why it doesn't compile. It's not a compact constructor. So if you look at the, the constructor there, there is, a, there is a string type. If that was a compact constructor, everything would be happy. But it's not a compact constructor, it's a regular constructor, which means, this, is, this actually has nothing to do with records, but this has to do with uh, the way things work with like methods. When you, the, the type on the left side of the assignment is the same as the type on the right side of the assignment. They're, they're, the compiler can't tell the difference. It, considers both of them to be constructor parameters. And the downside of this is, oh no, this dot type was never assigned a value. And it doesn't know what that is. So the sa same way if you have a final, um, if this is a regular constructor with a final instance variable, this would not compile either. So you would have to say this dot type equals type dot two uppercase, because it can't distinguish. And there's one more problem, because while the instance initializer and the type are both issues, they're the same issue, so that's one compiler error. The third one is the method type is a void return type that tries to return a string. Yep. So you can override methods, but only if you match the signature. So in this case, there is an existing method implicitly defined, uh, which I believe is string, string type, and it gets replaced with void type. So that's an invalid override, doesn't compile for the same reason that if you tried to extend a method in a class. All right, so next one, we have two more. Yeah, okay. So, so take a minute to read it real quick. Actually, there, I'll, I'll, I'll probably skip this one. There's no real trick in this one. This one does compile, and you can have records implement interfaces, so that's perfectly fine, and you can, they don't, they don't define a compare to method for you. You have to define that explicitly, but that one, the answer is B. And then the last one, just enough time to do this one, I think, because uh, it's a shorter one. Uh, how many people, uh, how many lines do not compile in this example? Does it take 10 seconds? It's a shorter one, so hopefully there's enough time. All right, how many people think A is zero? How many compiler errors, I mean? Uh, one compiler error, two compiler errors, and three compiler errors. So this one, the answer is C. And the reason it's C is because, I mentioned earlier, you have to use final, non-sealed, or uh, sealed as a modifier for the subclasses. The permits clause is allowed to be excluded, so that's fine in the, in the, in the sealed class because they're in the same file as nested classes, but you still have to say that they're final, sealed, or non-sealed, or use a record. You have, to, you have to use one of those types. So that one doesn't compile for the, the two subclasses don't compile. And with that, just enough time for a book giveaway. So we're gonna use the same format we did last time, which is, excuse me, we're gonna call, we're gonna call out numbers. Um, if you don't want a book, just don't call out a number. 
And when we hit the maximum number, we're gonna then run it through a random uh, number generator on uh, Gene's phone. The book we're giving away for this one is our second book, which was for the 816 and 817 exam, which no longer exists, but now composed of half of the 819 exam. <laughs> so it is what it is. Um, going in the first line, kick us off if you can. Okay. Just say pass if you don't want it to. Uh, I don't know which way to go, but so, just start calling out numbers more. Okay, so 15. This works really fast. Well. Yeah. Four. What are the single, Come on up. What are the single digit numbers? Um, if anybody has any additional questions, Gene and I will be up here. Feel free to come mm -hmm. up, talk to us. Uh, other than that, enjoy the rest of your day.